The Things They Carried First Lieutenant Jimmy Cross carried letters from a girl named Martha, a junior at Mount Sebastian College in New Jersey. They were not love letters, but Lieutenant Cross was hoping, so he kept them folded in a plastic at the bottom of his rucksack. In the late afternoon, after a day's march, he would dig his foxhole, wash his hands under a canteen, unwrap the letters, hold them with the tips of his fingers, and spend the last hour of light pretending. He would imagine romantic camping trips into the White Mountains in New Hampshire. He would sometimes taste the envelope flaps, knowing her tongue had been there. More than anything, he wanted Martha to love him as he loved her. But the letters were mostly chatty, elusive on the matter of love. She was a virgin, he was almost sure. She was an English major at Mount Sebastian, and she wrote about her professors and roommates and midterm exams, about her respect for Chaucer and her great affection for Virginia Woolf. She often quoted lines of poetry. She never mentioned the war except to say, Jimmy, take care of yourself. The letters weighed four ounces. They were signed Love Martha, but Lieutenant Cross understood that love was only a way of signing. It did not mean what he sometimes pretended it meant. At dusk, he would carefully return the letters to his rucksack. Slowly, a bit distracted, he would get up and move among his men, checking the perimeter. Then at full dark, he would return to his hole and watch the night and wonder if Martha was a virgin. The things they carried were largely determined by necessity. Among the necessities, or near necessities, were P-38 can openers, pocket knives, heat tabs, wristwatches, dog tags, mosquito repellent, chewing gum, candy, cigarettes, salt tablets, packets of Kool-Aid, lighters, matches, sewing kits, military payment certificates, sea rations, and two or three canteens of water. Together, these items weighed between 12 and 18 pounds, depending upon a man's habit or rate of metabolism. Henry Dobbins, who was a big man, carried extra rations. He was especially fond of canned peaches in heavy syrup over pound cake. Dave Jensen, who practiced field hygiene, carried a toothbrush, dental floss, and several hotel-sized bars of soap he'd stolen on r and in Sydney, Australia. Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried tranquilizers until he was shot in the head outside the village of Tan Key in mid-April. By necessity, and because it was SOP, they all carried steel helmets that weighed five pounds, including the liner and camouflage cover. They carried the standard fatigue jackets and trousers. Very few carried underwear. On their feet, they carried jungle boots, 2.1 pounds. And Dave Jensen carried three pairs of socks and a can of Dr. Scholl's foot powder as a precaution against trench foot. Until he was shot, Ted Lavender carried six or seven ounces of premium dope, which for him was a necessity. Mitchell Sanders, the RTO, carried condoms. Norman Bowker carried a diary. Rat Kiley carried comic books. Kiawa, a devout Baptist, carried an illustrated New Testament that had been presented to him by his father, who taught Sunday school in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. As a hedge against bad times, however, Kiawa also carried his father's, or excuse me, his grandmother's distrust of the white man, his grandfather's old hunting hatchet. Necessity dictated. Because the land was mined and booby-trapped, it was standard operating procedure for each man to carry a steel-centered, nylon-covered, flak jacket, which weighed 6.7 pounds, but which on hot days seemed much heavier. Because you could die so quickly, each man carried at least one large compress bandage, usually in the helmet band for easy access. Because the nights were cold, and because the monsoons were wet, each carried a green plastic poncho that could be used as a raincoat or ground sheet or makeshift tent. With its quilted liner, the poncho weighed almost two pounds, but it was worth every ounce. In April, for instance, when Ted Lavender was shot, they used his poncho to wrap him up, then to carry him across the paddy, then to lift him into the chopper that took him away. They were called legs or grunts. To carry something was to hump it, as when Lieutenant Jim E. Cross humped his love for Martha up the hills and through the swamps. 
in its intransitive form. To hump meant to walk or to march, but it implied burdens far beyond the intransitive. Almost everyone humped photographs. In his wallet, Lieutenant Cross carried two photographs of Martha. The first was a code of color snapshot signed Love, though he knew better. She stood against a brick wall. Her eyes were gray and neutral. Her lips slightly opened as she stared straight on at the camera. At night, sometimes, Lieutenant Cross wondered who had taken the picture, because he knew she had boyfriends, because he loved her so much, and because he could see the shadow of the picture taker spreading out against the brick wall. The second photograph had been clipped from the 1968 Mount Sebastian yearbook. It was an action shot, women's volleyball, and Martha was bent horizontally to the floor, reaching, the palms of her hands in sharp focus, the tongue taut, the expression frank and competitive. There was no visible sweat. She wore white gym shorts. Her legs, he thought, were almost certainly the legs of a virgin, drying without hair, the left knee cocked and carrying her entire weight, which was just over 117 pounds. Lieutenant Cross remembered, touching that left knee. A dark theater, he remembered, and the movie was Bonnie and Clyde, and Martha wore a tweed skirt, and during the final scene, when he touched her knee, she turned and looked at him in a sad, sober way that made him pull his hand back. But he would always remember the feel of the tweed skirt and the knee beneath it, and the sound of gunfire that killed Bonnie and Clyde. How embarrassing it was, how slow and oppressive. He remembered, kissing her goodnight at the dorm room. Right then, he thought, he should have done something brave. He should have carried her up the stairs to her room and tied her to the bed and touched that left knee all night long. He should have risked it. Whenever he looked at the photographs, he thought of new things he should have done. What they carried was partly a function of rank, partly a field specialty. As a first lieutenant and platoon leader, Jimmy Cross carried a compass, maps, code books, binoculars, and a 45 caliber pistol that weighed 2.9 pounds fully loaded. He carried a strobe light and the responsibility for the lives of his men. As an RTO, Mitchell Sanders carried the PRC-25 radio, a killer, 25 pounds with its battery. As a medic, Rat Kiley carried a canvas satchel filled with morphine and plasma and malarial tablets, and surgical tape and comic books and all the things a medic must carry, including M&Ms for especially bad wounds, for a total weight of nearly 18 pounds. As a big man, therefore a machine gunner, Henry Dobbins carried the M60, which weighed 23 pounds unloaded, but which was almost always loaded. In addition, Dobbins carried between 10 and 15 pounds of ammunition draped in belts across his chest and shoulders. As PFCs, or spec fours, most of them were common grunts and carried the standard M16 gas-operated assault rifle. The weapon weighed 7.5 pounds unloaded, 8.2 pounds with its full 20-round magazine. Depending on numerous factors, such as topography and psychology, the riflemen carried anywhere from 12 to 20 magazines, usually in cloth bandoliers, adding on another 8.4 pounds at minimum, 14 pounds at maximum. When it was available, they also carried M16 maintenance gear, rods and steel brushes and swabs and tubes of LSA oil, all of which weighed about a pound. Among the grunts, some carried the M79 grenade launcher, 5.9 pounds unloaded, a reasonably light weapon except for the ammunition, which was heavy. A single round weighed 10 ounces. The typical load was 25 rounds. But Ted Lavender, who was scared, carried 34 rounds when he was shot and killed outside Tonki, and he went down under an exceptional burden, more than 20 pounds of ammunition, plus the flak jacket and helmet and rations and water and toilet paper and tranquilizers and all the rest, plus the unweighted fear. He was dead weight. There was no twitching or flopping. Kiawa, who saw it happen, said it was like watching a rock fall or a big sandbag or something. Just boom, then down. Not like in the movies where the dead guy rolls around and does fancy spins and goes ass over a tea kettle. Not like that, Kiawa said. The poor bastard just flat fuck fell. Boom, down, nothing else. It was a bright morning in mid-April. Lieutenant Cross felt the pain. He blamed himself. They stripped off Lavender's canteens and ammo, all the heavy things, and Rat Kiley said the obvious. The guy's dead, and Mitchell Sanders used his radio to report one U.S. killed in action and to request a dropper. They then wrapped Lavender in his poncho, 
They carried him out to a dry paddy, established security, and sat smoking the dead man's dope until the chopper came. Lieutenant Cross kept to himself. He pictured Martha's smooth young face, thinking he loved her more than anything, more than his men. And now Ted Lavender was dead because he loved her so much and could not stop thinking about her. When the dust-off arrived, they carried Lavender aboard. Afterwards, they burned Tan Ki. They marched until dusk and dug their holes. And that night, Kiawa kept explaining how you had to be there, how fast it was, how the poor guy just dropped like so much concrete. Boom down, he said, like cement. <laughs>